Hi, welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, we're excited today. So excited. For something totally new and different on our uh, podcast. It's the first time we've ever had guests. And somehow we magically secured legitimate celebrities. So we're excited <laughs> to <laughs> introduce April and Beecher. You guys might know them from various and sundry social media platforms, but we'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, thanks, guys, for being on. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, this is fun. Tell us a little bit about yourselves as a couple and individually, whatever you would like to share. I'm sure people would like to hear a bit from you. Sure. So uh, we are a married duo. We've been married for almost eight years. Yeah. And we live in Tennessee. We have two daughters, five-year-old and a three-year-old. And they're adorable, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. They keep us, they keep us young. Um <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you're, you're TikTok famous and somewhat social yeah. media famous. small, small famous on TikTok, I guess. Um, and then Beecher recently came out as non-binary, which, so we started our own podcast called the non-binary marriage. Cause you know, we were both raised very uh, conservative and that was a struggle, but that's kind of <laughs> why we're here. So we'll get to that later. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, as you all said, my name is Beecher. I'm non-binary. My pronouns are they, them. I am a uh, filmmaker. And so a screenwriter, director, uh, that's, that's my kind of passion and, and what I, and, and then, yeah. And then supporting April, April of joy on TikTok and all those things and writing her celebrity status, some to get our podcast <laughs> Sometimes out. Sometimes feature gets to be in sketches with me. And that's yes. Yes. Those are good. <laughs> Do you help with like the editing and the production part or is that is that a team venture? It's definitely the more advanced ones. I'll have features much quicker and better at like editing special effects. So and every once in a while, April posts a TikTok. I'm like, why didn't you color correct that before you threw it <laughs> Yeah, I literally posted one today and and they were like, uh, the lighting's terrible. I was like, why <laughs> like yeah, me and Susie were talking about like, maybe we should start a TikTok. And then I was like, I don't have the foggiest idea what to do in TikTok. I was like, I can barely watch TikToks, let yeah. alone make them. Like, I yeah. don't. So, so yeah, your guys' stuff is, it's really good. Like it's fun to yeah. watch. It's like engaging and it's very well done. So it's extremely so, well done. Yeah, yeah. When I first joined TikTok, I, I found you April and I really liked your content and I followed you. And then like five minutes later, I was like, oh, she's a Christian. And then I was like, <laughs> kind of worried for a second. Cause I was like, oh, well, Christians are preachy. And but then like, I just kept giving you a chance. And I was like, no, she's not like that at all. Like you don't, you're on your TikTok. You are not preachy. Yeah. You don't, that doesn't seem to be your goal. So what is the goal of your TikTok? It's a great question. Um, my goal is to be like anti-preachy, I guess. Um, if, if I'm preachy to anyone, it's just to Christians to stop being jerks. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. basically, um, I used to be preachy though. And so that's probably why, but I guess the goal of what I do on TikTok, I mean, it happened accidentally. I didn't like start TikTok with some mastermind plan of like what I was doing. I downloaded it in the pandemic. Um, but then I ended up finding community of other, originally it was other Christians who didn't like Trump, who <laughs> felt like we were going crazy. And then it evolved into deconstruction and really just being a safe place for people that have religious trauma to really just make fun. Like I like to make fun of the more toxic and just weird traits of evangelicalism. Yeah. Um, and I think it's healthy and healing to laugh about the weird things we've all gone through. I will say like when we downloaded TikTok like two years ago, right at the start of the pandemic, it was very much like, oh my gosh, we're not alone. Other people think like we think. And that's what I think we get the most out, out of it. I even by proxy get the most out of is all these people messaging me like, wait, I'm not alone. There's other people that think <laughs> mm -hmm. like me and have similar questions. So that's been pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. And I think the humorous as aspect really disarms people too, because there's a lot of even like satirical Christian comedians that will point out some of the things that you point out, but they do it kind of from a different vein, but like you still laugh at it because it's funny. And then even diehard Christians sometimes will laugh at those jokes, even though they're like actually really pointed. So it it's good to know that there is some ability for people to laugh at themselves you know, and hopefully maybe it leads to them saying, oh, maybe some of this stuff isn't the best stuff to believe, you know, so. Yeah. But yeah, you guys have done a lot of, of interesting stuff with like different productions. Beecher, you've done a lot of different films. You've won like some contests and some awards. And then 
April, you're on a couple different podcast things, right? I haven't listened to the Evangelical-ish a little bit, to, but tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, so that actually formed kind of organically from TikTok too. I met um, Pastor Paul and that pastor from Oklahoma. So I think uh, Pastor from Oklahoma, he still does online pastoring, but they're both former pastors. One was a former AG pastor and one's a former S- uh, Southern Baptist okay. pastor who are in the same boat that I was just kind of fed up with the Christian nationalism and you know, the Christianity, like American Christianity, which is pretty much about everything except for the love part, right. which we think <laughs> yeah. is the whole part. Um, so we pretty much, it's an hour podcast weekly where we talk about current events and we just rail against uh, modern evangelicalism pretty much. Cool. And then well, the other podcast is the one with Beecher where we are telling our marriage story. Yeah. And I, I heard about you actually, the first time I heard of you was actually when you were on Graceful Atheist podcast. And mm. so then I was like, Oh, who is this person? So then I went to TikTok and then I didn't know about the non-binary marriage podcast. Susie told me about it. And then I voraciously consumed that. And I was like, oh man, this is like, this is so interesting. And I was like, I've got to get these people on the show. And, and Susie, I was like, are you crazy? Yeah, Susie's we have like, like six episodes published. Yeah. And she's like, <laughs> she has so, like a half a million followers. I don't know how many you have, but something yeah. like that. So <laughs> I can't believe you said yes. Yeah. Oh, no, it's fun. It, it was more... Uh, appealing that Beecher could come on too. Oh yeah, I was like, I get to join this one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it. Let's go. We love you, Beecher. Yeah, that podcast. I come from a really fundamentalist background, not charismatic fundamentalist, but like IFB fundamentalist. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, the Christian college thing. When you have talked about your time at your Christian college experience, I went to Liberty, so I, it was mm-hmm. right down the highway from you. So I was like, oh yeah, I know what she's talking about there. So mm-hmm. when you guys then had this podcast about being non-binary and all that, I was like, oh man, that's going to be, that's going to be wild. And honestly, and I think me and Susie both had this conversation. We were like, what is non-binary? Like, like, what is it? You know? So that's something we want to talk about. Cause I really want to hear, mm-hmm. I obviously have a better grasp of it now, having listened to all the episodes, except for I missed today's, but it's so fascinating. And I have like a real deep appreciation for the struggle and also like just the human aspect of that whole journey. I hope you coming out has been like healing, even though it's been hard. Yeah. That really came through. Yeah. It's been really good. It's been, uh, I've been out publicly now really like online for a couple months and it's been really nice. And just like now everyone knows before that I was out to friends and family and and briefly what non-binary means is just someone that doesn't identify as male or female. They just don't identify in either of those boxes. And oftentimes it means that they're going to present in a more gender non-conforming way, but that is not a requirement of it. Someone is not non-binary because they present a certain way, but oftentimes if they do not feel like they fit either of the gender boxes, they will have a style or, or, or expression that, that kind of fits neither, fits neither. But yeah, really, it's just someone that says, you know what, I don't feel like I fit these two categories. And that's something that I've always felt and I've found words to put to it really in the last couple of years after a lot of therapy and a lot of, I mean, that's what a lot of the podcast gets into. Right. Yeah. I, I think that was something that really comes through in your podcast is how much of this was not a choice, (laughs) like zero of it. I mean, that is so clear how much it impacted you as a child Mm -hmm. and um, even through to your adulthood. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, going into the podcast, I don't think we were quite ready for how many people would be listening to it, but that's been really, really great. I think the two groups were almost, we almost made the podcast for is first and foremost, people that are going through similar things. We've had a lot of people reach out, a lot of couples and, and, and individuals reach out, say, I'm going through something really similar. I thought I was the only one. Thank you so much. You gave me the word gender dysphoria. I'm now like going down this rabbit trail and finding, figuring out so much about myself. And that's been great. But also the other side is like the people that think I just like, woke up one day and been like, I think I want to put on makeup and a dress and call myself non-binary. Because it's trending now, right? Right. (laughs) And it's like, you know what, like for any really like, you know, conservative or someone that's, that's more closed minded and think it's just a a whim decision, like, well then maybe uh, someone who's come out as non-binary can send that to their parents, this, to this, this podcast to their parents be like, Hey, I'm not going to get into all my stuff, but listen to these people's story. It might be easier for you to consume when it's not, you know, their, yeah. their son or daughter or a child that's, that's going through it. And so really those, yeah, those two things. And it was a lot of discussion of like, okay, how far do we need to go in detail to our journeys? Cause I'm like, you know, it, and so that was something that we wanted it to come through that it was, that wasn't a choice. And it's been a 
uh, you know, something I've dealt with for, you know, two decades, but also move it along quickly and, and kind of, you know, keep, keep other things in perspective as well. Yeah. It's definitely very vulnerable and, and open, you know, and it's funny cause I like when April will be like, I don't know if we should really get into this. And then you'll be like, ah, who cares? You know, and you just go for it. So <laughs> like, which is awesome. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's, that's refreshing too, because like one of the things you see, you know, when people talk about human sexuality, especially when they have come from the conservative background, it, everything is taboo. You know, mm -hmm. you can't talk about it. It's not something that's accepted. And so, yeah, so we're definitely going to dig into the non-binary <laughs> marriage thing. We'll talk a little bit about purity culture and human sexuality, and then a little bit about your faith journeys. To backtrack a little, what is kind of your guys' faith background? Mm. You cover this a little bit in various and sundry platforms, but kind of tell us a little bit about where you come from. Yeah, so our backgrounds are slightly different. I was a pastor's kid, preacher's kid, evangelist kid, um, traveled the world, was homeschooled for most of my schooling, and Pentecostal, uh, but non-denominational. And yeah, my, my parents were, I mean, they were preachers and they were a little bit Christian nationalist, a little bit homophobic, like, you know, <laughs> sprinkled in all the things. Um, but what I saw in them, like they genuinely did love people or at least try to love people, which, which I think is why I was able to, when I saw like bad things happen behind the scenes, being a PK, you see everything could be like, oh, well, those people just like, weren't really following God. Yeah. But I grew up in purity culture hardcore. I went to Christian schools, Christian colleges, but I was also like very much in it. Like I sang on the Jim Baker show when I was a teenager. Nice. Yeah. The song was called America Say Jesus. And yeah. we sometimes walk around the house <laughs> singing it. Just yeah. kind of. Yes. Don't you have a, an album to it? Like, didn't you release a CD or something? I did it. That one was just a, a single. <laughs> that, oh, a single. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you wrote a book. You're so impressive. I did write a book. Um, it, it will never see the light of day. It is so homophobic. Oh, I'm going to track it down. No, no, please don't. Like, it's, it's like, if you, it just needs to be burned. April runs <laughs> April runs her TikToks by me and she's like, I might read this passage of the book and that just I be wrote. like, look how awful I, I oh, was. Man. I'm like, you can't. I'm like, you like, can't be, like, just no. draw the line. You're not, we're not putting sound you in the world. You can't tear the veil that much. <laughs> like, it's like endless, endless content. That makes yeah. you look terrible. Yeah. I was a big Republican. And you wrote, you wrote the book when you were how old? I mean, you were. I was 19, 19. when I wrote it. Okay. So clearly I knew but, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. A lot of life experience. <laughs> yeah. So that's my background. Okay. Beecher, what, what was your background? So uh, my background is very tame compared to April's. Um, but I grew up uh, Christian, went to Christian schools. I mean, it was, it was like non-denominational or Baptist, I guess, if you would kind of go, go that direction. I got saved, so to speak, when I was in sixth grade, right when I was dealing with my first like really serious uh, bout of like gender dysphoria and panic attacks. And so it was very much like I gave my life to Jesus to fix me. Mm -hmm. And so then everything after that was using kind of Christianity as like a shield to not have to deal with my sexuality or my gender. And then like, anytime I'd feel any fear, or anxiety, just like cling, cling to the Bible or the youth group or the, and so I was like the perfect Christian quote unquote boy. Like mm -hmm. that was my identity, like pretty perfect. And, and I was like probably the most Christian in my family. My family was very Christian. Once again, they chose to put me in Christian school, but I was probably the most like die dedicated. hard, dedicated, committed Christian. Oh, that's really interesting in my family, but it's cause I was just so scared. And I right. fully look right. back and realize that now. And that's why I went to a Christian college and then a Christian grad school and then worked at a church full time and then worked at a Christian school. Like until December, my entire life has been either in Christian school or, uh, or uh, um, you know, uh, basically a job that's under a kind of a Christian denomination umbrella. So finally out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so we have, me and Susie also have like different backgrounds too. I guess Susie and I, to be grammatically correct. Um, so I grew up independent fundamentalist Baptist preacher's kid, that whole thing. So a lot of the things that you talk about, about being a preacher's kid, although I wasn't in a, like a mega church and didn't land on, PTL or anything. I, I, I empathize with some of that stuff. Um, and then went to Christian school my whole life, Christian college, you know, same kind of thing. So, 
I, I echo a lot of that stuff. And then Susie's mm-hmm. background is condolences. Is, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> Susie's background is totally different. So we have some interesting conversation. A lot of the things that you guys talk about with your fundamentalism and evangelical, it's totally foreign to me. Like I didn't even really know what the rapture was until two years ago or something. Like wow, I, that is such a blessing though. <laughs> right. <laughs> Imagine not having that childhood trauma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was never worried about that. Yeah, I, I grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran, and my family was uh, pretty normal. I went to the secular, you know, public schools, and I uh, was never forced to read the Bible or, like, write any Christian songs or go <laughs> on the Jim Baker show, you know. <laughs> I My entire family is very devout and faithful, and they're very much believers, but nobody ever made it their whole life. My uncle is a pastor, so maybe he did. But, yeah, compared to all you guys, it's, I, I had it pretty good. Yeah, she's what we would call, a, you know— a backsliding, not real Christian. Not a real Christian. <laughs> I actually would agree with that. I, I never yeah, was. Warm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, totally, totally. I own it. Yeah. And what's funny is like my background, I would have looked at you, April and Beach, and be like, oh, they're not Christians either because those Pentecostals. It's fair. And I would have said the same to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You're Baptist. Which is so. just so funny. Easy. Like the, the yeah. differences <laughs> between the fight in fighting in Christianity is yeah. so, something like now looking at, I'm like, how come I never thought that that was weird? Like, you know, <laughs> it was just totally normal to hate every other version of Christianity mm-hmm. except for my own. So yeah. what led you to begin deconstructing your evangelical mm-hmm. stuff? Oh, man, so many things. I'll, I'll just give the quick Cliff Notes version. I started deconstructing probably when my dad died, which would have been in 2011. So, you know, almost 11 years ago. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer and died within four months, but we were very Pentecostal. So we believed in healing and believed that he was going to be healed. Like I had never had more faith for anything in my life. Um, and obviously God did not heal him. My dad died. And, um, after that, I really wrestled with like the big, bigger questions of, you know, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God not answer my prayer? Does God even answer prayers? Um, that kind of thing also just saw like really, um, that's just a really ugly side of Christians after that. Like I had Christians that told me and my family that we just didn't have enough faith. Um, or like my dad was li- out, uh, living outside God's will, or we had some kind of unresolved sin, or honestly, the most annoying was that, Oh no, God did heal your dad just in heaven. Mm. He got the ultimate healing. <laughs> uh, just like, it's the worst. That's not what you asked for. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that was not what I prayed for. Um, <laughs> So that was kind of when I slowly started, but I, I would not have told you that I was deconstructing at the time. I didn't, mm-hmm. it was very internalized and I didn't really know what was happening, but just things started to not fully make sense. I think I, so I think I deconstructed like the Pentecostal side of my faith first before okay. other things. Um, the next thing for me was in 2015. Uh, well, actually, I guess the next thing would have been Beecher. Um when we were dating a month in was when they told me that what we now know was gender dysphoria, but we didn't have that language at the time. They just told me like (laughs) through tears that when they were in sixth grade, they put on their sister's clothes right? and, and we're like crying. And I was like, I I didn't understand what (laughs) What do I do with this? I I was like, it's okay. It was a long time ago. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> yep. I was like, why does this matter so much? <laughs> right, right. You thought it was just a thing that you tried when you were in sixth grade. Yeah, sixth grade. I like had no concept. This is like an internalized identity yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and at so, that point you were already like dating and you know, invested. We had only been dating a month. So okay. I, I had I could have gotten out of there. But... Way to drop the bomb early, Beach. I mean I, I know, I know. <laughs> nice. I definitely did. Well, April's the first the first person that I that I had fallen in love with that I'd really like had feelings for. And so it just was like, you're, she's getting, it's getting really vulnerable and right. you're about to, okay, fine. I got to tell you this secret. <laughs> Let me keep it from everybody. Yeah. Um, which, sorry, go back to your deconstruction. Yeah. Journey. Well, no. So, I mean, but that was an ongoing deconstruction, deconstructing thing, just trying to figure out yeah. Beecher's whole deal. Like mm-hmm. what on earth is happening? <laughs> um, and then in 2015, so we had been married for a little over a year. My brother came out to me as gay that definitely shifted where I stood at least politically on LGBTQ. I didn't know where I stood theologically, but I knew it, at least it wasn't a choice. Like I had been taught. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And then the next big thing that I talk a lot at length is Trump and the Christian Mm -hmm. worship of Trump that just made zero sense to me. And so that's when everything started really unraveling. And then the pandemic and how they handled the pandemic and I could go off, but I won't. BJ, how about you? (laughs) 
I mean, my deconstruction, <laughs> well, once again, my, since my faith was based on this idea of uh, living perfect and saving myself for marriage, and then God's going to make me the manly man that I'm supposed to be father, husband, all those things. And then when that, that, you know, I meet April, I fall in love with her. I start having panic attacks and start to go a little crazy. It's like, wait a minute. I don't know what's happening. This isn't part of the plan. My whole faith was based on this. And so that was when it started for me. Cause it was just like, this wasn't what I signed up for. Like I've not been choosing the narrow way for, <laughs> you know, for, for 14 years and, and, you know, ha- just having a lot of struggle to now suddenly find the love of my life and not be able to be close to her. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was, that was when it started for me. And then of course, I mean, I think the big, the huge wake up call as April mentioned was when Trump was kind of worshiped by, by this culture that we were very much in very much in still. And we're all like, wait a minute, are we crazy? And we kind of, we started deconstructing together. Like we would kind of bounce ideas off of each other. I'm like, what do you think about hell? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And so like, but we would be at different places at different times, but we just gave, we were like, something's not right. So we gave each other the space and the grace to figure it out. Even if we didn't agree at the time. Right. That's actually really huge that you were communicating to each other while you were deconstructing. Cause like I did it all by myself and I didn't tell my mm. husband anything until I was done. Mm. And I probably shouldn't have done that in retrospect because, um, I started lashing out at him just knowing inside that like I had different beliefs than what he thought I had and I had different beliefs from what I thought he had. I felt like he didn't even know me. Mm. And so I started unconsciously being like kind of mean to him and Mm. taking it out on him. And he was like, what did I do? What's happening? But as soon as I told him and like we worked through it all, it got so much better and our marriage has been better than it's ever been ever. Mm. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Susie's not one to pull punches. She does. She's not gonna be nice. Like, what? <laughs> not not that she's mean, but she t- she's direct. So the, uh, ju- oh. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit to tell you how me and, how Susie and I met was I have a blog oh, that yeah. I is a fledgling little blog, and I wrote my whole deconstruction story out on there, and she, it had been out in the ether in the various like ex evangelical groups and stuff. Cause I hadn't posted it publicly. And she messaged me saying, Hey, I read your story and it was really good. She goes, but I have a couple like grammar uh, suggestions for <laughs> oh you. Are you open to hearing them? And mind you, I didn't know who she was except for I had read her blog and I'd seen her <laughs> name and I was like, Oh yeah, sure. Like, you know, so she told me and I, I went and changed them. And then I was like, you know what? This chick's got some gumption. Like, I, I need to, I need to rope her into something. Thanks so, for saying not balls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, so that's kind of how we met. And I was like, well, I've always wanted to start this podcast, and you know, so I stole the name of her blog, which is Flawed Theology, and that's how we made this podcast. It's interesting, a little bit to me, that a big factor of your deconstruction process is around Beecher's identity. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, the non-binary marriage and how, because like, if you hear those words together, most people will be like, what the hell does that mean? Like, how could you have a non-binary marriage? Like, especially when you come from our background, you'd be like, oh, if I found out my partner was non-binary or gay or any other quote unquote sexual deviation, it would be like instant destruction of the relationship. Yeah, so, right. The way you guys turned that into a way to actually make your marriage stronger is awesome on so many mm-hmm. levels. So so let's talk about that a little bit. I know Susie had a question for April. She's answered it in her in the last few episodes of the Non-Binary Podcast, but I'll ask it anyway. And the reason I'm asking is because um, so when we were like stalking you guys doing research for this episode, <laughs> I found your, your picture of Beecher on IMDb. And the first thing I'll say about that picture is that you looked so happy. Like you were like glowing. And the second thing is I was like, oh, that's what they look like. And then I was like, well, like logically, you know, the logical part of my brain is like totally fine with this. And then there's like also a different kind of like internal reaction that's like, oh, that's not right. It's a guy in girl's clothing. And so I'm just being so honest and raw with you right now. I wanted to ask you how to work through that. And then April in the last few episodes has been talking about how that happened to her. And it took you a long time to get over that. Like you want to be supportive, but yet you're like kind of a little bit put off by it. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so what's your advice for that? Sure. So for me, I, well, one, I got a therapist 
that I could talk these things through. So I wasn't talking to Beecher about them because I knew like if I was honest with my thoughts that they were hurtful to them. Um, but one thing that helped me was it, when I had a reaction that um, like knee jerk was just unpleasant or I was disturbed or bothered in some way. I would just try to figure out what the, where the root of that was coming from and ask myself, like, am I April, like personally bothered by this or have I been conditioned to be bothered by this? And most of the time it was because I was conditioned to, because then I would have to logically be like, what about this is wrong? Like, what about this Mm -hmm. is bothering me? And it's like, it's just clothes, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. It's the clothes. And so I had to each time kind of go through each steps of like, why is this bothering me? What about this is bothering me? Is this actually bothering me? And so the more often that I worked through those things and then realized like, no, I've just been conditioned to live in a very, like to see things in a very, like boys do this and girls do this then that helped me to just like be chill about it and realize like it's literally just clothes or makeup and it just doesn't matter. Yeah. I grew up with that conditioning, you know, that anything sexual was a choice, you know, being gay mm-hmm. was a me choice, too. you know, transgender wasn't even really on the radar, mm-hmm. you know, back when, when I grew up or anything like that, everything was all just about morality and mm-hmm. it was all anything that wasn't hetero, you know, one man, one woman, one lifetime was deviant. So wh- what do you think, like from your perspective, because you grew up same background, where where do you think that really comes from? Like seeing that obviously it's not in the Bible, you know, where does where does that indoctrination and, and that programming come from? I, I mean, I think it just comes from the patriarchy in general and just the systems of white supremacy and the patriarchy at its root of it's a way of people to, if you can keep people in line and in their boxes, then you can keep your power Mm -hmm. over them and their boxes. Yeah. That's really good way of putting it. Definitely about power and control. It's just like recognizing where our ideas come from. And that is the result of conditioning and indoctrination and that we should expel those ideas, take them off and evaluate things for ourselves. Like I want Beecher to be happy (laughs) And I want them to wear the clothes that they want to wear. Why shouldn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a hard thing for people to really even like wrap their heads around. Even even now, having listened to the whole podcast, and I know a few other people in the trans community, and I know a lot of um, LGBTQ people. Like, there's still that programming in me that like I'll see something on TV, you know, two guys kissing or whatever, and I'll be and I'll have a visceral reaction to it. And then, like Susie was saying. In my logical mind, I'm like, who cares? But that programming is so deeply ingrained. It's like it takes a conscious effort on someone's part. And they have to really want to change that. You can't just say – you can't just tell yourself, oh, that doesn't matter and ignore it. You have to actually do the work. And I think that's the thing people don't want to do. They don't really want to get to know someone who's trans, non-binary because they want to keep them at arm's length because then – if they can keep them at arm's length, then they're not a real person. Do you, you know? find that feature? Have you have you found that people don't really want to approach you or like get to know what's going on? Um, yeah, unfortunately, and it's usually not on a personal level. Uh, basically, the circles that we ran in, you know, going to a Christian church. I, I worked at a, a Christian university. Uh, there's just I was in a lot of spaces like that, and they kind of viewed me as a PR nightmare because of the culture war that's going on and so they would be basically like privately be like hey i understand your story and love you but please don't come back like don't be around here and so oh, like that's so sad oof. yeah but i also understood who their bosses were and i understood that if they openly say a pastor says yeah come and you can wear a dress that pastor would get fired within a week you know what i mean like it's right it's it's a it's a system of power and control and you know, I'm still working through a lot of it because that's newer for me, you know, the past six months of getting kind of pushed out of places that I was celebrated, really celebrated to definitely now being an outsider. But, but it wasn't, I will say it wasn't, it was never very hateful. I think in my middle school head, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, my family's going to disown me if they know I'm going to be called this. I'm going to be in, you know, it was never, it was never my worst fear, but it was, it's still difficult. Um, 
And so that's something that I'm that I'm working through. And as far as you know, visceral re- visceral reactions to trans or or um, LGBTQ people. The, I mean, in the twenties, if women's were women wore pants, people had visceral reactions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's yeah, it's it's just what you're used to and what what you're yeah. what you're conditioned to. I will say I'm really excited with the way culture is going. Not let's just forget about politicians politicians and government for a second. But as far as right. culture <laughs> is going, because like the internet's here. I would not be out non-binary if I hadn't found other people and seen them have the courage to come out before me. Um, And the more people like me feel comfortable to come out and be their authentic selves, the, the more opportunities people will have to see me. And then when the next non-binary person comes out, it's the, the visceral reactions lessened. You know, it's in it, and right, and that's one reason I wanted to be because I, I'll share. I have a TikTok. I don't, I don't post as much as April, but I have a TikTok. It's at Hello Beecher, and you know, sometimes people are like, "Why are you sharing this personal stuff? Why are you putting this out there?" Because I'm like, because if other people hadn't done this, I wouldn't be here. Because mm-hmm. when I, when someone yeah. feels completely alone, like they're literally the only one going through it, like I, I wouldn't have had enough courage. Um, I didn't have enough courage. It was only after I saw other people, and so. I'm excited about that and that more and more visibility is happening because the internet's here and social media is here and it's what people are connecting with. And it's what I saw was watching for years and kind of getting up the courage to come out and be myself. How did your families react? And this would be for both of you as a married couple, you know, you've got in-laws and outlaws and you know, like how did both of your families react to Beecher's revelation? My, my family, well, so my dad has passed, but my mom and I have two brothers, they both, they've all reacted pretty well overall been very supportive. I mean, but I think my one brother who's gay kind of paved the way of acceptance for all of us <laughs> yeah. already. Cause you know, right. we, they, we had already loved and accepted him. Um, my immediate family has been great. I've definitely have had some extended family that, you know, was like, we don't want them around the grandkids. And like, oh. um, yeah. Beecher. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Um, I will say that I've not been cut off from anybody. No one's disowned me. No one said, don't come to any family function, but it's still this weird place of like, okay, Beecher, we really want you to come to, you know, this birthday party, but please don't wear anything feminine. Please look like a boy. Uh, Please look like a boy, you know? And so then, so then it's this line of like, for me, it's like, okay, but like, it's really tough. I'm so thankful for my therapist. Cause I'll, you know, take these situations and I'll talk it through with her. I'm like, well, I don't want to never see these people again, but also I don't want to go be someone I'm not anymore. Cause I've spent most of my life doing that. And well, so, it's so emotionally draining for you. It is. It's really emotionally draining. Mm-hmm. I don't enjoy those. I, I don't enjoy those get togethers when I don't feel like I can be authentic in myself. And so it's this weird line of like, well, we're, where do I put the boundaries up? When do I say, no, if you're inviting me, you're inviting me, however I show up, Mm. but that's hard to do. Or if I know a family member who's not very supportive is stopping by the house, like, do I take off the dress that I'm wearing? Uh, It's just, it's, it's complicated. I'll say, but I, but I will say I've got, I have a lot of trans friends and I will say the majority of their parents have completely cut them off. Like no, no, no relationship. And I will say my immediate family is trying. Sometimes they are not moving at the speed that I would like, um, but they are still communicating with me and they're still trying. So it's complicated. I, I will say though, there have been some really fun theories from family <laughs> on why Beach <laughs> is the way that they are. Would, yeah, would okay. you tell so, my favorite one? <laughs> yeah, so, my, so this one wins the award. So I have, I'm not going to say who. I have a relative, it's not my immediate family, a relative who only saw me once or twice a year, family get togethers. And once again, I was the perfect Christian quote unquote boy. And so I never did anything wrong straight A's. I mean, it was just all of it. And she wrote my mom and said, the reason Beecher is non-binary is because one time when they were in college, they came over to our house and watched the walking dead and demons came out of the show and, and <laughs> infected him. And that's why Whoa. they're non-binary. <laughs> And well, you guys I'm did like, think it was demons at one point, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, no, I, d- I definitely <laughs> did. But I never once connected it to The Walking Dead. Wait, the Walking I told Dead. That, I told it to some of my friends. Well, 
one, my, my, this, this person acted like I was watching some niche show. It was like when The Walking Dead was the most popular show. On so 80- why wasn't everybody in the earth non Exactly. Right. Exactly. And I joked around with some friends of ours and they were like, you know what the connection is? You saw all that zombie makeup and you were like, ooh, I want to try some makeup on tonight. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's... <sighs> The things that people come up with as explanations for things that they have no experience or understanding of is so, it looks so amusing, but like people, I'm glad that you can laugh about they it. They say it so confidently. And they say it like, oh, I know exactly why. And then they don't realize like the hurt and pain, like the fact that you have to have that level of like self-awareness when people are coming over your house, you can't even be comfortable in your own skin. Mm-hmm. or in your own clothes or in April's clothes or whoever's clothes you want to wear. Mm-hmm. It's your damn house. Like right. you should be able to do whatever you want, you know, and setting those boundaries I'm sure is, is difficult. Can yeah. I ask a follow-up question about um, Beecher, about your family? Do you think they had any idea that it was coming? Like when I told my sister that I wasn't a Christian anymore, she was like, Oh, I kind of saw some things along the way that made me think. And I was like, Oh really? Like I didn't realize I was letting it out. Do you think they saw anything along the way that made them suspect something might have been going on? I will say that the power of denial is very strong. Once again, I don't want to get into specifics with specific family members, but I will say that a general theme is, you know, I tell them 10 years ago about in crying about the time that I put on my sister's clothes in fifth grade. And they're like, oh, it's not a big deal. And then I tell them about, you know, I, I've, I've, I've kept them updated throughout a decade and then when i finally come out as non-binary they're just like shocked right and i'm like i'm like i've literally been telling you like i've I tried to give you all the hold up the card you know? right right but and, and so yeah just denial is just i think with at least my family it was easier to hear that take that and go that's not a big deal all right moving on and then you just mm-hmm. never never process it, never deal with it. You just worry about your own life. And then when I come out as non-binary and then more, even probably in a bigger moment, come out publicly as non-binary. Now my family's getting fielded by questions by their friends, you know, then suddenly it's something they have to deal with. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very complicated, the the family front, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something that we're navigating and trying to work through. Yeah. I'm sure that's definitely challenging. We both have families that are different than than how we believe. Those are challenging, but it's really nothing on the scale of what you're dealing with. Because to me, it feels like like a change in a belief system is something that yes, I chose to do. This is something mm. that's it's actually no. Well, I'm gonna push back on that. Well, maybe you can't you really didn't, choose but, what you believe. No, no, you can't you, choose what you believe. Yeah, yeah. That's not what I mean. Like what I mean is like the belief system is is not something that is internal to who I was, whereas your gender identity Mm -hmm. is who you are. And that's the thing people don't understand about that because it's just so foreign to them. They can't understand. Yeah. And I mean, it just, it reaches into everything. So if my fan, if someone, if someone is like, okay, yeah, let's hang out, but just don't talk about being non-binary gender identity. I'm like, Hey, if I can't talk about you being non-binary, then I really can't talk about my Christian faith because it really is connected like pretty intently. I can't talk about deconstruction because it's pretty intently. I can't talk about why I'm no longer at this for this, this employer, which it's pretty interconnected or why I know, you know, like it's, 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 it's everything. So if I go and I can't present how I feel and if I can't talk about my gender identity and or anything related to it, I'm pretty much talking about the weather. Um, right. <laughs> you know, and so it's, it's not just a belief in a certain area for me. It's, it's like, as you said, it's, it's who I am and it really impacts a lot. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I resonated with on your podcast is April, you saying that you don't identify with the, with the traditional female gender role. Like you don't like to cook. Mm-hmm. I don't like to cook. My husband does all the cooking and Beecher, you're not like the macho manly man and neither is my husband. And I was like, oh, that's just like us. So when before like when you were evangelical christians were you trying to fulfill those roles and failing and now have you just accepted how you are like can you talk about that a little bit yeah so i mean i grew up being taught about female submission or like the wife submits to her husband and which i never fully bought into even though (laughs) 
I was an evangelical because I was very much, yeah. I was a feminist, but I wouldn't have said that I was because that was like a bad word. Um, same, same. Yeah. Right. But I was very much like, no, I'm going to do my, like, I know that I am better than just being owned by a man. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I still like all the gender roles were very much instilled into me, but I, I was also like really athletic and I loved playing video games and I like, I, gen- I hated women's events at church I really too Ugh. yeah like and I would have said that I didn't like girls which I realized was just like internalized misogyny what I didn't like was like the cookie cutter version that the church said a girl was supposed to be um the girl that you are on your tiktoks yeah yes exactly <laughs> right. my blonde yeah. wig um right. yeah like I would like I'd hang out with the guys and do all that stuff so but when we got married it was really it was weird like I felt like I had to cook so I definitely attempted to cook um, I didn't cook the best. I cooked <laughs> casseroles mainly. <laughs> that did you probably- burn a lot of stuff? <laughs> a lot of grilled cheese and Beecher would make fun of me because I didn't I never made sides. Well, April would be like, April like, I made dinner and she'd be so excited. I'd be like, okay. And she'd be like, it's cheese enchiladas. So it's it's flour tortillas. I would usually it's have chicken, chicken. Sorry, chicken, cheese. That's it. And I said, Great. Is there anything else? Nope. I didn't make vegetables. <laughs> just, just chicken, <laughs> cheese, and tortillas. And that's I was like, something oh, okay. I would do. So I nailed it. I, yeah, I was like, this is plenty of food. What do we need more for? Why would I make more? <laughs> we have all the food groups right here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I will say when I we, we met in graduate school, I was there for getting my MFA in, in film directing, and April was there for master's in journalism. And our very first conversation, April was telling me how she was going to go into broadcast journalism and how she was going to be on, you know, she may have said Fox news. That was the goal at the time. Who knows? But like, she was very career minded. She was uh, very strong, very passionate. And so like in general, we never, if you look at any oh, stage of our relationship, it was never super defined gender roles because that was something right. that I really loved about April is how independent and how just she's her own person. And and I was, I, I was looking for that in a partner. I don't, I mean, we can probably get into reasons why, but in general, I was looking for that and I was really attracted to that. So when I definitely wanted, like, we were pretty much always equal partnership the whole time. I will say my dad growing up, he would not have said he was a feminist, but he very much was when it came to me because he told me my entire life, like, get your career started first, get a career, and then you can get married if you want to, because you don't want to have to play second fiddle to a man was what my dad would say. So I very much had that like going in of like, whoever I marry, like they're going to like, no, I'm not going to do this sub- submitting thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're so lucky. Your dad told you that. Yeah. It was a weird, like I, it was oddly progressive in a very conservative yeah. area, but he, but he wouldn't have. Yeah. Like he was definitely a feminist, but he would have never said it out loud. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it probably would only apply to you, but right. If it was someone else in the church or something like that, then that might have been a different story. Yeah, because my parents together actually very much fulfilled traditional gender roles. Like my mom did all the cleaning and the cooking and very much kind of submitted to my dad. So it was just interesting that with me, though, he was very much like, no, you're you can be whoever you want to be. Even I remember (laughs) saying, too, when I was like three, I was like three or four. And because my dad would tell this in, in church that I was like, Daddy, I think I figured it out. The girls sing and the boys preach. And my dad was like, mm, no, April, girls can preach too. Girls can do whatever they want to do. And I was like, oh. oh, so I grew up, I grew up knowing that. So thankfully. And just from the stories yeah. that I've heard so many from her, from her dad, I don't know. He's just, he's a fascinating person that had a lot of definitely really- had some things wrong, but like, I think that's one reason why I was able to deconstruct out of the toxic Christianity is because I do think my parents like they weren't the toxic part of Christianity. Like they were the good part of Christianity that keeps people in Christianity, but they just kind of fell. And, you know, Mm -hmm. when you're in those circles, you end up just doing problematic things because everyone's doing problematic things. Well, when the problematic things uh, pay the bills, yeah, you you tend to stick with them, you know, unfortunately. So to avoid this um, episode being three hours long, should we (laughs) close out this section? Is there anything else you want to say about being non-binary? What do you want us to know? I mean, I'll uh, I'll say that this is the happiest that I've ever been. That if anyone's listening and they're discovering themselves, keep doing the work, keep going on the journey. It's hard. Be open and honest. If you have a partner, that's the best thing you can do, and that the end is worth it when you finally can just be yourself and be authentic. It's worth all the other stuff. That's so great. Well, thanks for being so open about it. Yeah, of course. 
Yeah, and if you, and if anyone's listening that hasn't listened to the non-binary marriage podcast, please go listen to it because it it will open your eyes and your mind. If you mm-hmm. even if you are progressive and you think you know something, you don't. That kind of leads into talking about purity culture, which is, I know, uh, a high horse for April. So I think this is going to be, this will be fun. She'll get her good and worked up. So mm-hmm. you went to a Christian college. Mm-hmm. Did you have the experience as a, a woman that you were there in college to get your MRS degree? Oh, yeah. You know, and get, and get married. <laughs> and how, how did purity culture in college, like the pressure around that with gender norms and I kiss dating goodbye and all that fun mm. stuff. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, there was this joke ring by spring that all the girls were mm-hmm. only there to find their husband and then they were going to quit, which I mean was true for a lot of the girls. Um, but yeah, probably the worst experience that I had with purity culture was that um, I all out the school. I don't care. It was Southwestern Assemblies of God University in Texas, um, AG school, Pentecostal. And they had chapel every single day. So they were extra religious and you had to go. <laughs> and once a semester, they would have week long, kind of like convocation, but in this, in the one was purity week and the other one was like spiritual emphasis. But on yes. purity week, Mm-hmm. You would have chapel morning and night every single day for the whole week. And you had to go. It was mandatory. And at the end, they handed out um, purity cards, like purity pledge cards. The pledge, that yes. You would check saying like basically that you're going to commit yourself to not have sex until marriage. And you would say like, I, April, am a, and you would check either a virgin or a secondary virgin. Oh, that's so oh, gross. Yeah, which a, second, a secondary virgin is someone who, have, you know, unfortunately messed up and Satan got to them and had already had right. sex, but then was recommitting. Right. Like one guy got up and was bragging about he had seen God restore girls' hymens before. Uh, <laughs> um, real, real good stuff. So, wow. and, yeah. And then they had an altar call at the very end after going through a week of indoctrinating you to not have sex before marriage. Mm. Uh, then an altar call for people to come up to the altar to pledge before God and before your fellow students that you would not have sex until you said I do. So, right. That was yeah. fun. Oh, I can't even imagine this. It was yeah. like, I'm trying to put myself in a situation. I think I might have just walked right out and quit school. <laughs> Like, how do people just sit there and take it? We're, we're all indoctrinated. Well, also, yeah. the school was very strict. And, uh, like, a lot of kids ended up going there because, like, their parents were pastors and it's the only school that they would pay for them to go to. Um, so you kind of had kids there that didn't really want to be there. But you would get kicked out for, like, the dumbest things. Like, I had a friend who um, they found condoms in her boyfriend's car and they kicked her out. But they they just gave him like community service because he was on the football team. There you go. So like, oh. there's your patriarchy. Dude, for I you. actually had a few friends that got kicked out. So mad. One of them got like caught going to a club. Anyway, it was just stupid. Very dumb stuff. Yeah. So like, everyone would go forward during the altar call because you didn't want to be put on the blacklist where everyone would like spy on you to make sure that you were living holy a holy life. It, I only lasted one year. I left after a year. So. <laughs> Did you ever use the excuse to not date someone that, oh, I'm dating Jesus right now? I never said I was dating Jesus. Thank God I was not that cringy. I had <laughs> friends that were that way. But Kudos. I, did, I did use God sometimes or I'd be like, mm, I just don't, yeah. I think God wants me to be single right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That happened to me a lot, which is why I didn't date very much in college. Also, I was a complete dork. So, I mean, that. <laughs> That probably didn't help, but yeah, the, the purity culture thing is interesting. So how did purity culture and all that stuff feel in light of your own like questions about your sexuality? And Beecher, you went to same school, right? I went for, to for your, for your graduate. Yeah. Yeah. For Regent. Yeah. Regent university for the graduate degree. Yeah. I mean, well, I will say for, for me and, and with purity culture, it was like a nice shield. Oh, not, I mean, it was, it was harmful in the end, but it gave me a shield. Like I played baseball and basketball in high school. And, you know, some guy would come up with their flip phone and show me a picture of a naked woman. And I'm just like, no, I don't <laughs> look at that. I'm a Christian. You know, the real reason I want to look at it is I might look at it. I would probably look at it and be thinking, oh my gosh, I really like that outfit. I, I want to try it on, you know, like that's why I'm, why I'm actually terrified to look at it. But instead of like, Oh no, I'm a Christian. I don't do that. I, oh no, I'm a Christian. I don't do that. Oh, mm-hmm. you know? And so for me, it was this, um, it was this excuse that I could hide behind 
why I was different, why I didn't engage in any of the sexual, super gendered talk in the locker rooms. It's because Oak Beecher is just that perfect Christian kind of boy and, and pure and all that stuff. But I remember like the only thing in any of the small groups or any of the groups that the guys groups that I went to was pornography. That's like the only topic that was like, okay to discuss. I remember being like in a small group in college and then being like, all right, uh, you know, we're doing porn month, which is, which is all <laughs> about, porn month. yeah, it was called porn month. And it was just forced four weeks on like pornography. And at the end, there were 30 of us in this small group. Like, I think it was 26 came forward saying they, str- they struggled with pornography. And I was one of the four that didn't. Cause once again, I'm like terrified Super. of investigating anything in that realm. And so right. I'm like, Oh, wow. Like, I thought none of us were looking at it, but I guess just not, I don't know. It was just this weird shield that I hid hid behind. And then when I met April, of course, I'd not dealt with any of the stuff that I needed to deal with, which Mm -hmm. led me to panic attacks, to a number of other things. And so once again, purity culture affected me, but differently, obviously, than than April. I I love that I had purity week and you had porn month. Right. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Was that based around every man's battle porn week? <sighs> was that was that the book? A relative Cause... gave me that book. And I remember yeah. li- so literally I'm in high school. Someone gave me that book and I'm like, Beecher, I we know you're going through stuff and this book will help <laughs> you understand it. And I once again am going through gender dysphoria. And I literally thought when I got the book, like, oh my gosh, finally someone's gonna explain this. I like open it up and I'm like, no, no, Wrong. no, 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 no. I'm a freak. I'm never reading this book again. <laughs> If this is every young man's battle, then what the heck am every I? Every man's what battle, am I? yeah. <laughs> Except Beecher. Except Except Beecher. Like, you know, if I'm not a man, you know, it's just this freak right. out. And so literally that book was like, all right, that's probably in some attic somewhere. Hmm. Yeah. So how have your views about sexuality in general changed? Oh, This is kind of part of deconstruction, but also as a result of your sexual identity discoveries and, and all of that. How has that changed? And how does it affect your marriage too? You don't yeah. have to be graphic. So <laughs> you say, do you be graphic or don't be graphic? No, I, said, I said, you don't have to be graphic. <laughs> oh, okay. so. yeah, what kind be of as graphic is as this? possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we did just talk about porn mom. So like what level? <laughs> yeah. Um, Can't um, wait to put the content warning on this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, my view on sexuality, has changed so much. I mean, so purity culture teaches, I mean, basically, whether you have sex or not before marriage, you come away, you come out of purity culture with shame, like shame for just having thoughts because they say like, oh, you just think of you just lust after someone. It's equivalent to sleeping with them. So like you just feel like you can't do anything wrong or right. And you're just this awful human being. So I had a very unhealthy view of sex when we got married. Lots of shame. So I was also uh, assaulted while I was in college at a different college. And I was a virgin at the time, but like purity culture doesn't teach about consent. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling shame about the fact that like, technically it was sex according to like definitions of it, even though I didn't choose it. So I suddenly felt like the crumpled up rose or right. No, the chewed up piece of gum that they say. And yeah. So anyway, so I was realizing kind of starting to deconstruct that back then, but not really. I just was like, if I'm feeling all this shame, I'm going to sleep with someone and actually like enjoy it. So I ended up before I started dating Beecher, I dated a guy for a couple of years and we like, I chose to have sex with him. I think it was like a power move, like of empowering the trauma that I was going through, but that was like leading up to when my dad had cancer and like, to tell you the thoughts that like, I literally have had thoughts that my dad wasn't he- like, God didn't heal my dad because I had premarital sex. Mm-hmm. Right. But like, like the level of shame that I had from that consensual adult sex for years after that was ridiculous. So after my dad died, I pretty much shut down my sexuality again until Beecher mm. and then it came alive. And then as we've talked about in our podcast, which we won't get into, but because of Beecher's and gender dysphoria and what they were de- dealing with. And they were a virgin when we were together. They kind of demonized me for, because you're also taught to like the woman is supposed to save themselves for the man. Like the woman is the one who loses her virginia. A, a man takes virginity. It's well, so when we, when we got married, we just weren't, we, we had a very unhealthy sex life. Also, I had just never, never was taught about female pleasure. 
even in like right. women's groups, even as like a teenager and in youth group, it was always talked about like, oh, once you get married and once you can have sex, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> and like women, your goal is to fulfill a husband, like fulfill all of his needs, even if you're not in the mood. So even though I didn't like prescribe to that, I, when we got married, that's kind of, that was my mindset. So we, I mean, I kind of looked at sex as a chore in a way to mm-hmm. just fulfill Beecher's needs and never, like, I never, I didn't even know that like I could empower myself and like have my own pleasure. Like it wasn't even on my radar to right. even attempt that. So my, yeah. how it's changed is I got, I literally a couple of years ago, I, I actually got a sex therapist because I had never, can I say orgasm? I had never had an yes. orgasm because <laughs> Yeah, there was like so many like battles in my head of like what it actually was. And I felt like there was something wrong with me because I couldn't from just intercourse. I was just very uneducated on it. So I went and found a, ther- a therapist who specializes in sex. And then I read a book and I bought a vibrator and thank the God almighty that I have <laughs> orgasms now. <laughs> so Hallelujah. Your uh, TikTok yes. recently was so funny when Beecher popped up behind the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I know all orgasms better. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh. I died yeah. laughing. Yeah, because you have that other um, TikTok where you're like back from your honeymoon, the cr- and you're like, <laughs> and they're like, "How was the sex?" And you're like, "It was great." <laughs> you know, and I was like, "Oh, that that resonates so so much because like I grew up pur- purity culture too. Like I saved myself for marriage, you know, and all that stuff. And my wife saved herself for marriage and we did it all God's way. And then 10 years later we got divorced and we also had a mm-hmm. shitty sex life throughout the whole marriage, which was a lot of the same for the same reasons. And then I dealt with shame post divorce. Cause I was like, well now I, it's not premarital sex. It's postmarital sex. So let me just go, <laughs> go ham a little bit. And then of course I had to deal with the shame of that. Yeah. Not good results from purity culture. Mm-hmm. It was something that we've had to spend a lot of, of effort to untangle. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So just curious with having two girls, when they get older, have you, th- have you given any thought to like how you will educate them without purity culture? Yeah. I mean, we've definitely, we've talked about it some, we, we haven't talked about it at length because they're still young. Yeah. Um, we're, but I'll say this in our marriage, we're at the stage where we're like in our lives, like, okay, I'm interested in trying this. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, we can try that in our sex life. And we've, you know, done some interesting things and it's been, it's been like, oh, that wasn't good. We won't do that again. (laughs) Oh, that was kind of fun. And so like, we're, I think right now exploring on kind of inside our marriage, we're still monogamous. We still, we've not been with other people since we've been married, Um, but we're exploring stuff in our personal lives almost like because we didn't get that in college or we didn't get that in high school or we never have had the freedom that we have now yeah and so i will say we maybe have mentioned i don't even know if we've mentioned honestly what we're going to tell our girls when they get older it's kind of like a we've got a little bit of time and we're at least i mean i, I will say what we have talked about because we occasionally will throw out things of like well, what do you think about this and it being some you know I, i'm trying to think of how not to be offensive but (laughs) sorry basically okay so the other day i was like an orgy what do you think about it is it wrong because i feel like it's wrong (laughs) and then april's like i don't know is it and so then we go in this like hour-long conversation of like well why do we think it's wrong and is and like and so like we're untangling this i think the thing that we always come back to as a for sure must and this is what i want to stress to the kids is consent and communication Mm-hmm. Like consent and communication and safety and safety, safety mm-hmm. yeah. has to be, has to be huge. Well, because I think here's where I think we would, where I would think the for, the uh, force, not the force, the focus would be is that there are plenty of reasons to abstain from sex in, in high school that don't involve shame and yeah. fear mongering, you know, like just safety, like getting pregnant and yeah. STDs, like there are practical, logical reasons to abstain. And I think, like, I think hopefully we'll have like an open, like a very open relationship with our kids and tell them about our struggles and like where we messed up and have open dialogue about it. But also like, I want them to be able to look at us as a safe place to talk to us. Cause I know like, even if we were to push abstinence, there's a very good chance that they're not going to abstain whether we tell them to or not. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather have open dialogue and let them be able to trust us and be open and honest with us without shame. Right. If they don't have a fear of hell looming over them, which I'm assuming you're not going to instill in them. uh, It's (laughs) no, just just the rapture. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) 
Yeah, they got they got to toughen up somehow. Right. You better I just, practice. I just slip in the left behind books right. just into their library. And that's, that's hilarious. We're naming the dog Nikolai. That's what we're going to do. I don't know what that means. Oh, you didn't read left behind. That's why. Oh, no. Watch out for those locusts. Yeah. That's such a niche joke. But, <laughs> I knew you guys would get it. Yes. I feel uh, so left out right now. Oh, uh, that's okay. You're left behind. Yeah. <laughs> See what you did there. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, human sexuality and, like, especially, like, post-Christian or post-evangelical sexuality is such a fascinating thing to, like, dig into because, again, like we said before, like, that programming is so ingrained. Like, I have a, a 12-year-old stepdaughter, and, you know, she's in middle school, and it's very interesting because she told me that she's pan a couple weeks ago and i'm like do you know what that means and she's like yeah it means this i mean she explained it and i was like okay that's cool what does that mean pansexual she doesn't care like either way she could be attracted to boys oh. or girls or no or neither and i was like okay the biggest I thing i think from purity culture that's so damaging is teaching a person that their body is evil mm -hmm. you know that your your sexual desires are sinful but supposedly god made you that way so right. you have to crank up the cognitive dissonance right from, you know, age 10, you know, or whenever mm -hmm. you start to have those thoughts and feelings, you know, to say, okay, I have sexual thoughts. That's how God made me, but they're wrong. So let me turn them off, you know, and mm -hmm. that's just so unhealthy. And then magically on your wedding night, you're supposed to <laughs> flip the switch, have or become a porn star, yeah, have orgasms and know everything about how your whole system works, you know, which is, it's just not logical you know like, and also you're not supposed to ever find anybody else attractive except for your spouse or your partner which yeah. is like so unrealistic i see attractive people everywhere and how are you supposed to just turn that off right for everybody except one person in the world yeah mm -hmm. it's very interesting that i'm in a couple of like parenting groups that you know talk about like they're sex positive and even when i even saying the word i'm like i'm not sure i can do that like i don't I don't know, yeah. you know, but it's like, it's something, an area of growth now, even as an adult trying to figure out and re reconstruct certain things of how you're going to look at the world, you know, so. I will say, I mean, the fundamental, the idea of parenting under a fundamentalist religion feels easier. Cigarettes, mm -hmm. bad, sex, bad, right. Bible, good, mm -hmm. church, good. What? You know, like, you just like, you just like. Evil, good, evil, good. Why? God said well, so. Right. Because that's also just living in a binary. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Putting right. things in boxes. It's black yes. and white. It's, uh, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all know, obviously, that it's much more unhealthy. It leads to worse lives and worse Repression. relationships. And But there's just so much gray. And so I think my hope is with our daughters that we, if they trust us, and April hit on it, trust us enough to talk with us. And that we can talk with them and that we can work through these things together and that hopefully in the moment we'll feel a piece about about advice to give them and a direction for them to go but yeah it's a lot to think about they my our oldest is not even six yet so we're really enjoying yeah these ages yeah. <laughs> i'm trying not to think too much i know about, I don't, stressful yeah <laughs> yeah definitely thanks for sharing that it's like it, it's very refreshing to just like have this kind of conversations with people and like it not be so laden with guilt and you can just talk about it and say hey th we're adults now <laughs> like you can talk about this stuff you yeah know, we can not... say the word sex yeah and orgasm like, and you, it's okay you, you, Ooh, beecher said orgy Ooh, i'm telling <laughs> <laughs> okay. let's move on and talk a little bit about deconstruction and kind of where you guys are we kind of covered this a little bit but you guys grew up well, April, you grew up Pentecostal. Beecher, you grew up non-denominational, but more more Baptist. But so, were you guys both like pretty fundamentalist with like literal interpretations of the Bible and young Earth creationism and the Bible's inerrant and? Oh yeah, yes, yes. I I had a textbook that told me the dinosaurs died in the flood. <laughs> oh, the dinosaurs died in the flood. They weren't even on the, the, ark. Yeah, on the ark. That's why they went extinct. Uh. It was Noah's ark. That's oh. they couldn't fit in the ark. Uh. Too big, of course. T Rexes are huge. Oh man, <laughs> even even answers in Genesis wouldn't agree with you on that. So man, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So how how has that changed? Like your views about some of those fundamentalist beliefs have those changed, or do you just kind of still believe them, but not really? Or like, what's your views on? Yeah. So I we both would still I 
unless something's changed, would still call ourselves Christian. Um, for me, that just means I follow the teachings of Jesus and I still believe in Jesus. Cause I think for me, believing in Jesus makes like, just makes sense. And I just, I, I like, we just have had spiritual experiences that I can't explain. So the, not like the language that I have for that is like, I'm just gonna call it Jesus and the Holy spirit and for now, but as far as like, uh, hell and literal interpretation and the rapture, like, I don't believe in in any of that. Like for me, I hold the Bible very loosely. Like I think, I think it can be really good, like historically, and it has a lot of good truths metaphorically, but that's, um, there's a pastor called named Greg Boyd in Minnesota. And he calls, instead of calling the Bible, the word of God, he calls it the story of God. And I kind of like that. It's like, it's like the ancient people's historical account of their understanding of God. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like, that view of it as far as like specific beliefs like i could tell you where i lean on certain things most of them which i don't know at this point because <laughs> like I, I will never know um, yeah. but for me like the belief part isn't as important because it's an intangible for like for me my faith is it is when i put it into action and I actually love people and i do things that help my community and help the marginalized and and so like that's that's how like that's kind of where I stand on like what being a Christian means or just being a decent human. But that's, I don't know if that makes sense. Like to me, the belief part isn't as important. Yeah. 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 What about you, Beecher? Yeah. I mean, I definitely adhere, used to adhere to the whole literal, the Bible's literal. Um, and, you know, we, de we spent years deconstructing our faith. And I would say for the last probably six months or so, I've been kind of reconstructing it and trying to figure out where I fall on things, but like the underlying reconstruction is happening with this fundamental core foundation of like holding my beliefs very loosely and having an open mind and being willing to learn. So, you know, if I decide, okay, this is kind of where I'm, what I, what I believe. And then someone in my life uh, says, or shows me, or says something different that I want to go learn more about it. I'm not afraid for information. I'm not afraid mm -hmm. to find out more you know, I, I will like, there's Christian witches. There was a, I did a trans therapy group. There was a witch in the group. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to know more. Like, I'm so interested. I'm so fascinated. Whereas before I would have been like, ah, I got to go pray for and fast for two <laughs> yeah. days. You know, like it was this, my, my faith was white knuckle, difficult and fear-based. And my initial reaction to anything new was fear and pray it away. Where now it is much looser and love-based and it's, oh, wow. I've never heard of that. Please tell me more. I want to hear your story. You want to go to coffee. And it's not any sort of conversion. It's not any sort of me trying to, you know, we don't, I don't believe in hell. Don't believe in the rapture. You know, it's not that type of guilt that's leading to those conversations. It really is just a willingness to, or a desire to learn. But I do consider myself a Christian because there are things from me being so hardcore kind of in the Christian faith that I do find liberating. I've, I continue to find liberating. Um, there's been spiritual experiences I can't explain. And in general, if I'm looking at scripture and it's being used for liberation, I usually embrace it. And if it's uh, scripture that's using that it, it's scripture that's being used to put people in captivity or bondage, then I'm like, no, that's not God. Like that's, that's not, that's not, that's not the God that I know. That's not the God that I am praying to and that I'm worshiping. And so it's not like this, you know, do research on every verse and figure out exactly who wrote it and when much more loosely. And then how is the verse being used? Because I mean, once the, I, you know, you can look at slavery and there were people using the Bible to free people from slavery. They're using the, the same Bible to keep people in slavery. And so then, and oftentimes using similar verses. And so it's just mm -hmm. kind of how the Bible is being used is a lot more important to me than, you know, it being literal or anything like that. Yeah. It's what you said about not being afraid to uh, seek out information and ask those questions. So like when I told my mom, well, I was already not a Christian by this time, but she didn't know that. And she thought that all these like questions I was having, which is coming out of left field. And she said, you're asking dangerous questions and you're asking them to the wrong people. And I just thought, no, that is the absolute wrong mindset. The way I'm doing it is the way everybody should be doing it. Everybody should be not afraid to seek out information. Everybody should be not afraid to scrutinize their own beliefs because really, if you have the truth, it should hold up to scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the way you guys are doing it, it's just like really brave to even take a step in that direction. Because most people don't get there. Well, maybe more people are now, now that deconstruction is sexy, right, April? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I will say, you know, I mean, where we're at in our beliefs, we we do talk about, okay, like, is Christian a name that we still want to put on ourselves? And I think we have gone with yes. And one of the reasons that I feel so, such a desire to do that, yeah, because the name Christian right now is so loaded with so much stuff that's negative, is the fact that I'm non-binary and that I would have given anything to have someone who is non-binary claim still still say hey i'm a christian i'm not going anywhere Mm -hmm. and that that would have been because if i'm in middle school and i see a trans woman on tv if she says i'm a christian and love jesus and still pray and you know still still adhere to this i would have felt like a safety to like explore whereas when she says yeah i'm an atheist i'm like oh no say you know you know like (laughs) so like you're saying like they're compatible so the christianity and non-binary are compatible and you want to show that Yeah. Like, like I know I have so many friends that were so hurt by the church uh, as far as personally, I'm totally great with and understand why they considered themselves to be atheist or whatever. But there's a, there's a group of middle school, high schoolers, even, you know, other people that because I still use the moniker Christian, they feel safe Mm -hmm. in kind of confiding in me, reaching out to me and, once again, because I, I do consider myself a Christian, but that is a reason. That's one of the reasons I keep the name and I don't mm-hmm. I don't say something else is because, I mean, I'm being told by all these circles to get out, you know, get out of the church, get out of the, this culture. But I kind of want to stay and make a difference. Well, because the point, like there are LGBTQ kids in church, like I think 30% of Christian Gen Z identify LGBTQ. So I think like as we go like as time progresses, like the church is either going to become fully affirming or they're going to become irrelevant. But I think part of like our passion is to create safe faith spaces for LGBTQ and to get people who are not affirming to at least start having the conversation to, to be more inclusive. And like growing up and I've talked about this a lot with my therapist and my family, like there were people that came out as gay or LGBTQ, like in my, not not necessarily family, but like friend groups or at church or here, there. And they were immediately, they immediately disappeared. They were like, went off to California. They, they, they were either kicked out of the church. Like I just never saw them again. And so what that told me, and once again, back then it really wasn't their choice. It was very Mm -hmm. much they were absolutely pushed and kicked out the door. But for me, what that said is like, if I tell them I'm trans or gender dysphoria or come out, I'm immediately going to be excommunicated. And so like, what does it look like to stay? So say I'm authentically non-binary and stay. I don't know. It's something that we're working through. And these are, if you can tell, these are conversations that we have a lot and we're untangling a lot of stuff still. And I would say that's the, most beautiful thing about where our relationship is now is that we can talk pretty much about anything. And there's not this undercurrent of fear. There's not an undercurrent of control. Oh yeah. That's an interesting thought. Let's talk about it. And then, but let's not, life keeps going. Let's not sugarcoat it. If you were to ask your regular evangelical today, they will tell you that we are heretics being led by Satan and that we are not actually Christians. Right. So right. There's also that they don't, they don't claim us. (laughs) Right. Well, and who wants to be claimed by them anyway? Yeah, at this true. Point? Like, like, yeah, you know. So Mama. you're probably that's that's a I classic. I don't claim good them rid- either. So yeah, it's a good riddance uh, situation. Do you ever to play a little bit of devil's advocate? Uh, not that I believe in Satan, but um, do you ever feel that you're like? cherry picking the Bible a little bit and kind of like me and Susie have this conversation a lot like, well, if you can kind of pick and choose how you want to interpret it, then is it really from God if it's just kind of based on how you want to take it? Because I kind of did the same progression in my deconstruction. I went from evangelical, fundamentalist, Baptist, that whole thing to progressive Christian, which like in a United Methodist church that was very affirming. It was very God is love. It was very heavy on social justice. And that really resonated with me with the questions that I was having. And then I started to look at the Bible and I only looked at the parts that kind of fit that for me. And so I really was like, oh, this is who God really is. Forget the hellfire and brimstone. Forget slavery. (laughs) You know, basically just just forget the whole freaking Old Testament. You can just chuck that out. You know, you know, let's focus on Jesus and and all that kind of stuff. And that felt really good for a good while, like seven or eight years. And then I kind of got to the point where I was like, well, I don't know if I really do, do I need Jesus to do the love and social justice and LGBTQ affirming, like, like how do you tie the Bible into it 
and also be deconstructing it? I don't know. It's kind of a circular question, but as far as for me, I'll talk for myself. I very much could be on that same path and I don't have fear in saying that, like if that's the direction that it goes Um, for me, I think I, when I look at most religions, I won't say every, cause I've not looked at every religion. I'll say every religion that I've looked at, people are picking and choosing from texts, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. what, what they're going to really adhere to and live by. And so I, I just feel like it's innately part of being in a religion is working through what you're going to use and let your life be led by. Um, well, and even the people that have a literal interpretation and in conservative evangelicals, they pick and choose. Like, I don't know right. anyone who doesn't. Right. And I, right, right, yeah. right. And I, so, yeah. so I think so growing up even like I can easily see the churches and worlds I was in, they picked and choose. So I don't have a problem going through and picking the verses that are liberating, that are loving, that are affirming, that are life giving and leaving the rest behind. That's a really good point. So when my mom um, and I had this conversation about the dangerous questions, uh, the reason it started is because my best friend is at Yale Divinity School. She's going to be an Episcopal priest. Um, and I'm super proud of her. I th- She's doing what she loves. And But my mom is, of course, like, women should not preach. <laughs> yeah, she kind of just like rolls her eyes and mutters under her breath whenever I bring it up. Um, and it was one time I kind of snapped and I was like, well, mom, you don't you don't go by everything in the Bible either. She was like, what are you talking about? She was like so offended. And I was like, you don't stone your children. Like, you don't have like. <laughs> And I just like throwing all these Old Testament rules out. So you're right. Like she cherry picks too, even though she's a literal fundamentalist Christian, she cherry picks. It, everybody does it. Yeah. I mean, the people that say they're literalists, they're literally not. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You wear mixed fabrics. Uh, how many of them? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. April, when you have your period, do you go hide in a cave for a week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the whole time. Surprisingly, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a really, um, I don't know if you guys know who Rachel Held Evans is, but yes. she wrote that book, The Year of Living Biblically, where she tried to follow the whole Levitical law, including going outside in a tent in their backyard during her, her time of the month. <laughs> I can really appreciate what you're saying, Beecher, about staying in in order to make a difference. Because like, if you really think about it, the idea of people's sexual identity and all that stuff It's literally a life or death issue. Like Mm -hmm. there's kids that you are probably literally saving their lives by being there for them. And that I don't care what you believe. (laughs) Like if you're doing that, that is, you can say it's godlike, it's Christian. It's just being a good human being and you're making a huge impact in the lives of people. And that's really what it comes down to, you know? And so if you're putting more love into the world, then whatever vehicle you're going to use to get there, great. If there are more Christians that did that, Christianity wouldn't be such a shitty word, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you would have no social media platform <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if every Christian just like put love into the world instead of, well, that would be no fun. Cause I love her TikTok. <laughs> oh, right. Right. But well, and it, yeah. And it just feels, it feels like the hand I was dealt, you know what I mean? Like the Christian religion and everything I've gone through and all that I know about the ins and outs of working in a church and Christian school and, and all of this, that the reality is, I think, you know, if I was born in a fundamentalist Muslim household, I'd probably be at a similar place of like, okay, I, this is what I know and I can make a difference and I see a way forward and I still get something from the religion that, Mm -hmm. that I find peaceful and uplifting and life giving in my private life, but also I can make a difference. That's a big piece of it. Mm-hmm. Well, and the interesting thing too, just theologically, even if you hold a very conservative, inerrant view of scripture, the conversations that Beecher's had with pastors about the theology around their identity and being non-binary and like what they're actually doing, they don't have anything scripturally that they can throw at us to say that we're living in sin. Like we're still no. married. We're still monogamous. Like there's... right. Like they literally have nothing. So our existence is a uh, one big like mind F to them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whereas whereas if we run off to, you know, heathen Hollywood, as my grad school would call it. Like if we go off there and you know, the church is fine with that. Oh yeah, they're they're ba- they back oh, there. there. Yeah. They're Let this, they're that. But, you know, yeah. like right. they went off the deep end and this is what happens when you stray from God. But I'm like, oh, no, I still love Jesus. I'm still here. Like, I'm happier right. than And I ever. literally cross-dress like every day. <laughs> like I wear I wear men's sweatpants and men's shorts. It's more comfortable. <laughs> and like the idea that and no one has ever I've done it my whole life. No one's ever been like, you're cross-dressing, April. Right. No, yeah. One, yeah. no one cares. So it's a huge yeah. double standard. 
Yeah, that's that's funny. I mean, we have like a whole like a lot more questions, but like we've been yeah. yakking for an hour and a half now. So I like, which is awesome. I, I could probably oh talk gosh. to you guys the rest of the night, but Holy. you got a TV show to watch, you know, but <laughs> I want to be mindful. So I don't well, know, Susie, do you have anything else that we want to like ask them about? April, one of your recent TikToks about the woman eating her son as a snack, it basically killed me. Hmm. All right, so I was like, is that really in the Bible? So I looked it up because you had on there Second Kings 6.29. Phil knows that my um, footnotes in my Lutheran study Bible are crazy. Oh, they're fantastic. The footnotes are inspired, not the actual right, words. Yeah, yeah. Of the, they're fantastic. My footnote says this. Woman does not simply regret the loss of her son, but complains that she unfairly did not get to eat the other woman's son. <laughs> I know, I know. She was mad because... One woman was like, they're a famine, yeah. apparently. Yeah. I was like, I, I wanted the context. They're like, let's eat your son, and tomorrow we'll right. eat my son. So they cook up her son, and then the next day, the woman and her son can't be found. And so this woman yeah. was gypped into feeding She's this like, woman her so son. so unfair. I don't get to eat her son. Right. She's so pissed. I had no idea this was a thing. Yeah. And then if you go to Lamentations 410, it also has like this poem about how women, compassionate women would, eat, women would boil their children during famine times. Yeah. There's some crazy shit in the Bible. It's a really uplifting book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's relaxing yeah, reading. Great for kids. I mean, even just on a culinary <laughs> level, everybody knows that boiling is not the way to eat anything. I mean, come on. Yeah. Air fryer. Yeah. Air fryer. <laughs> oh. Well, that's gross. But I think the only <laughs> other, the, I think we kind of talked about this, but like, I think, um, April, on your latest episode, you were saying that you're doing some research on Christianity and theology. What are you researching and like, what are you learning in that process? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was my question. Thanks for reminding me of that. What am I researching? Oh, I don't remember saying that. I'm sure I had something very. Specific. Yeah, it was at the very end of this of the episode that you published yesterday. Uh, Beecher said that you were doing some research in Christianity and theology. And I was like, oh, my, my point is <laughs> up. I was like, what's she learning about? <laughs> so, okay, I think, and actually this is good, they're bringing it up, because I think what was meant is in that season where the story was, April was doing a lot of research in Christianity and theology. Mm. Oh, okay. And okay. I can go back and, that's good you're mentioning, I can go back and we can re-edit yeah. our show and upload it, because I think I could clarify that. I think I was trying to catch it, people up, like where they were, re refresh where we were in the story. But at that time, you really were. I mean, we both had resources oh, yeah. I that was we were. De definitely doing deep dives then. I will say now, like, I'm, I'm not, at, I'm content in where I've landed, and mm. like, just being okay with, like, not knowing things. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm a curious mind. So I'm always wanting to know, like, especially if, if a, if a verse or a certain theology is being weaponized, then I try to learn the actual context so I can be like, no, oh, you're an idiot. Like that's not, true. <laughs> um, nope, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> you read Jesus and John Wayne and you talked about a lot about that. Ooh, that's a great book. Oh yeah. I mean, that yeah, was, that's... that was really pivotal. Well, that one like. was interesting. Cause I lived through a lot of Jesus and John Wayne but to to have it all in a book. Like you knew people that were being named. Oh yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I met that dude. <laughs> yeah. That's how I was when I read that too. I was like, oh, I know yeah. who that is. Moral majority was there. I was there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like that whole thing. I know I wanted to talk about Christian nationalism, but that might be a whole, like whole another episode, uh, you it's know, because bad. it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's freaking ridiculous. But like, but yeah, Jesus and John Newing was very eye opening when you looked at like, the reason, because I was always asking when the Trump phenomenon thing happened, I asked myself, how are Christians behind this chucklehead? Like, this guy mm -hmm. is the furthest thing from Christian that I've ever seen on the planet. I grew up, you know, through all these other Republicans that we supported, you know, that were good Christians and all that kind of stuff. And now we're supporting this guy. Like, I don't understand it. And then Jesus and John Wayne explained it perfectly like the whole power dynamic that led to that and i was like oh well that all makes sense and man that's fucked up like <laughs> you yeah, know, it's like, <laughs> so yeah Susie, you need to read that book just in case you were wondering i do so, it's i'll put it on my reading list it's a long list yeah i mean i don't want to keep you guys any longer i probably could sit here and like i hope Susie took a bunch of screenshots so we could prove that we actually talked to you guys. <gasps> i didn't take any yeah, but that's okay Wait, we have we do have we're still here yeah we want to take, take one like, yeah, we really appreciate you guys coming on and yeah, and, and being so like open. And I know you probably don't field these kind of questions every day from people. So we, we, we really appreciate it. And Beecher, your journey for me, it's something like I was telling Susie this when we first started talking about your podcast. Like, it's something I just, I don't understand at all, but I, 
like every episode I listened to that podcast, I was like, I'm driving to work sometimes like on the verge of tears. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this person is a beautiful person. Like, and so I just, I really appreciate Mm -hmm. your story and April, like the way you guys are, I hate to use this Christian phrase, but it came to my head doing life. (laughs) That's a a throwback right there. But like the way you guys are doing that, like it's, it's what people need to see. Like people need to see, this you know so i hope you guys keep doing what you're doing and that it keeps resonating with people and so yeah we we really appreciate you guys being on and yeah this is a this is a lot of fun thank you for fellowshipping with us <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah in the oh. foyer for snacks yeah in the foyer yeah the- next episode we're gonna take a shot every time you guys say the word season yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh gosh i did this season. i know we we have not oh. unlearned that yet that's no. still in i didn't even know that he pointed out to me i was like what does that even mean to Susie and i was like hey they say season a lot it's really oh. funny because that's such a classic I was like, word what does that mean? and she's and then the next episode she was like beatrice said season 12 times <laughs> season, like, like- <laughs> oh i probably did yeah it's I fantastic keep, especially I, it wasn't some 12 episodes, it wasn't 12 uh, some, some episodes, I, get, I get a word hooked well it's one of those things that like it's a perfectly fine word but in in the context when you come out of that you hear that word and it brings back like a whole flood of like oh i know exactly what you're talking about like doing life is another one it's just the season that we were going through like which was fantastic (laughs) they're never gonna say it again i love it i don't know i'm gonna be so in my head about it I'm going to look up all the synonyms for, for the season. next episode. Y'all listen. This there's gonna, time in our I'm life. pulling out the thesaurus. You're going to hear yeah. every synonym be, for season possible. Yes. Yes. So we'll know we did that. I feel like this could be a TikTok with a lot of leaves. And you could say in this and then just pull out the thesaurus. And you know yeah. what? I'm going to go back to the episode where I said season 12 times. I'm going to replace and put a synonym. It's going to be a different voice. I'm going to not try to hit the same tone. Oh, that'd be fantastic. You should just have like someone else completely say it. Oh, yeah. Like Perfect. maybe like maybe find something from Trump's audio book Siri where he say says it. it or Siri. Oh, oh. Yeah, be like, yeah, in this period of life, I was really... <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe a nice Australian or British voice. Like, you know. Yeah. That's awesome. That's All right, well... We won't keep you guys any longer. We we appreciate you guys being on and thank you so much for Yeah, this was so much fun. Yeah, yeah thank you guys so much for having us. Was, yeah, we was enjoyed wonderful. it. Yeah, let's keep in touch and be best friends, okay? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Flawed Theology Podcast. We want to thank April and Beecher for joining us today. And be sure to follow them on their various social media platforms. You can follow April on TikTok and Instagram at April LaJoy. And you can follow Beecher on Instagram and TikTok as well at Hello Beecher. We will have all their links in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and follow us on our social media platforms at Flawed Theology Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and listen to us wherever you find your favorite podcasts, and be sure to give us a five-star review. Appreciate it. Thanks, and we'll talk to you next time.